Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single-family homes all the way up to 600-plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we are working on your financial freedom. You know, I'm going to start the show just with a real quick story today. Thinking back earlier in the year, I got an email from a resident. Uh, must have been March or maybe April, you know, storm season here in, in North Texas. And, well, we'd had a pretty good horm- uh, hailstorm in, in, in his area. Um, it'd been a few days. Roofer signs were already popping up like mushrooms right in the front yard. And he sent me a few pictures of hailstones in his hand. They were huge, right? They were, they were good size. So did I, did I start to ruminate and worry and, and ponder what does this all mean? No, not, not at all. You know, as educated investors, we, we know the steps to take at times like these. And, and we know the people to have on our team to help us handle situations where there may have been damage, right, to, to one or even multiple properties. And you know what I did? I sent out a roofer. He got up on the roof. Sure enough, damage was there to support an insurance claim, and we filed it. And it was approved. It moved very fast. Now, I have chosen to wait a few months, get through the summer months, and take take some time. Uh, there were no active leaks, and we are finally putting that new roof on this very month. Now, obviously, that roofer is a key part of my team, but even more importantly in this situation and for my business in general is that insurance agent or maybe insurance broker. And I'll tell you, this is an important member of my team that helps me keep more cash flow in my pocket while both protecting and even improving my asset. That's right. We, we kept that older roof on this house when we rehabbed it two years ago. And guess what? Now I'm getting a new one. <laughs> Dirt cheap. I love it. Insurance is incredibly important. And uh, quite frankly, it will help you sleep better at night if you know you are properly protected. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Well, on today's show, I have a guest joining us to talk through insurance, through premiums, replacement cost versus actual cash value, and so on. Uh, I'm going to bring on Lee Siegel. He's with Integrity Personal Insurance. Lee and his team, they've been vendors with Lifestyles for quite a long time. I can remember talking with Lee throughout the years at the case studies when we were doing those in person, since 2014, in fact. Uh, Award-winning, multiple-time winner of uh, Vendor of the Month, rated 5 out of 5 by members on our vendor hub. And, in fact, Lee was recently named as one of DFW's best insurance agents by 20 uh, in 2020, rather, by uh, D Magazine, if you're familiar with that. Lee... Welcome to the show. How are you today? Thanks, Andy. Appreciate you having me on. It's good Abs- talking to you. Absolutely. It's a it's a critical it's a critical topic and, and it's a very wide ranging topic. We'll, I know you and I talked a little bit about some things we may hit today. We'll hit as many as we can. Uh, if any I'll give out the number here in a, in, a, in a moment for listeners if they want to call in with questions. But to start with, why don't you tell us about yourself and Integrity Personal Insurance if you would? Sure, Andy. Um, so again, my name is Lee Sigel. I have been selling insurance since 1993, so I don't know everything. There's not much that I haven't seen. Um, I spent uh, some time with a uh, with a company that is what's called a direct writer, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about the different types of insurance companies. But I joined Integrity about a little over six years ago, and Integrity is uh, an independent uh, insurance broker, meaning we represent multiple insurance carriers, so we can shop to find the best policies at the lowest rate. Uh, Integrity's been around uh, since uh, 2009, so I've been around for over half of the uh, the time it's been around. Great company. We're a, um, we're a Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider for insurance, and it's just a wonderful place to work. It's uh, my home there, and I'm the sales team leader over at Integrity, and it is, I'm there till I retire. Okay. So you mentioned a word there that I'm not familiar with, a direct writer. Um, what, what does that mean? Sure. So there are basically just two, essentially two different types of insurance agents. There's a direct writer that represents one company. So that would be like a state farm, a farmers, a USAA, uh, Liberty Mutual, things like that. So they have one rate. They're all wonderful companies, but they don't have options for their Client. So that was one of the reasons I left the company I was working for is I'd build up great relations with clients over the years, but when rates would increase and they'd call me and say, Lee, what can you do for me? 
it would be nothing. So with a broker, we represent and we represent multiple insurance companies. So if we place our clients with a certain insurance carrier, and for whatever reason that company takes larger than normal rate increases, we just automatically reshop and find them a better option. So we can keep them getting the best policy at the lowest rate and keep them with our agency because, Andy, as you know, it's not fun shopping for insurance. It's, <laughs> it's, it's time-consuming. It's just, you know, you're, you're having to give out the same information over and over again. So rather than calling three different direct writers, it's much easier to just call one independent agent and let them do the work for you. Got it. And okay, and I think I've referred probably on prior shows to I've, I've used the term captive agent um, to what you're same calling thing. a direct yeah. writer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah, and exact in, same. in Texas, if if I'm shopping around, so the list, you know, we, we've got listeners across the state. We've got folks that will catch the podcast outside of the state. Um, when I when I talk with a mortgage broker, uh, not, not necessarily you guys, but on average, what, how many lines are is a broker going to be shopping for someone like me? Well, and again, it depends on the product type, so it's a great question, because with home or auto, there's going to be a lot more options, maybe up to 20 different insurance companies for real estate investors, for you know the different types of products that we're going to talk about, you're primarily your landlord policy, your dwelling fire policy, probably only going to be six, seven, eight different companies, and it may be... Um, it may be varied based on the location within the state of Texas. You know, we have fewer options in the Gulf area because that creates a whole different type of uh, uh, challenges down there. But in other areas of the state, that we may have more options. Okay, and I'm thinking about the state of Texas. Is insurance is a regulated industry here? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, um, really, it's regulated mostly on pricing and the policies and discounts. So insurance companies do have to get everything approved by the Texas Department of Insurance. So they have to file their rates and file any uh, policy or product changes with the state. And it's a relatively lengthy approval process. So generally, don't see rate changes multiple times within a year because of the length of the process, you know, of, of filing those rates with the state and getting approval. Gotcha. So we're talking consumer protection there. I'm, I'm okay with that in this case. Hey, you're listening to Lee Siegel and Andy Webb. I'll give you the number here in just a second if you've got questions. You're listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Stay tuned. With the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. We're here to answer your questions and help you become financially free. Welcome back to the show. This is Andy Webb, and I am joined today by Lee Siegel, and we are talking about insurance. Huge, huge topic, very important topic for us as uh, owners of rental, residential rental real estate. Before we go any further, I do want to give out the number. If you've got questions today for Lee, you can give us a call at 855 855- Four nine seven four three three five. Again, that's eight five five four nine seven four three three five. Or send me an email to askandy at l u i n c dot com. And we were just kind of talking Lee about general insurance industry sort of topics. And the last question I have in that vein is, you know, I hear about I think it's A rated companies. Uh, are there B rated companies? Are there C? What, what does that mean? Do I care about that? Yeah, I mean, you do. It's um, So AM Best is the company that rates insurance carriers on their financial strength. So within an A, an A rating is the best, but even within the A, there's a A plus, which is superior, an A, and then A minus excellent. So again, those are good. Well, actually, there's a B, which is good, but you really just want to deal with an A-rated carrier. The thing is, most all insurance companies, and I can speak at least for integrity, we only represent A-rated carriers. And what that means is they have the sufficient financial strength to be able to pay claims. You know, because that's really why you have insurance is, you know, if you do have to have a claim like you were talking about on your roof earlier, you want a company that's financially solvent that can do that, especially when you have a 
large claim situation where some of these massive hailstorms can hit such a large area or a coastal hurricane or a tornado that you know that can wipe a huge swath through an area. So that's the important part. But again, most insurance companies are only going to represent A-rated carriers. There's no benefit to representing a B-rated carrier when there are so many strong A-rated carriers out there. And I guess if you're working with an insurance broker, I think I used the term mortgage broker earlier, but an insurance broker that's presenting you with multiple lines and they're presenting you with B-level or even C-level players, you might start to think, well, I, I don't know if this is somebody I should continue to work with. So that's very good uh, information to know. Now, you, you used a term earlier in the first segment. I believe you said landlord policy. Um, I, I typically refer to fire and dwelling. I think maybe when I've talked with you and other insurance brokers, that's the term we've used. That's just basic homeowners coverage, essentially. Or maybe help us with the, the terminology here. Yeah, and, and the policies are kind of termed differently. I mean, they're essentially a Texas dwelling fire policy. That's kind of the, probably the broadest term, uh, or TDP. You might hear TDP-1 or TDP-3. So it's a Texas dwelling fire policy, also called, called a landlord policy. Um, so that's your basic policy that's going to cover a tenant-occupied property. Um, so again, we can get into the differences between a DP-1 and a DP-3, but generally that's for a tenant-occupied property. When, you're, when you have uh, folks that are buying a property to renovate it, depending upon the level of renovation, what type of budget you're looking at on that, you know, is it including, you know, some or all of the big five, which, of course, is roof, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, foundation, you know, is it going to take a lot of time? Is the, is the renovation mostly cosmetic? Those are the questions that the insurance agent should be asking to the person that's wanting to buy the insurance so that they make sure that they are quoting the proper coverage for that. You know, I've seen people that will have a dwelling fire policy or a landlord policy on a vacant property that they're working on renovations. Well, if that's the case and there's a loss, the insurance company could absolutely deny the claim because there's the wrong coverage on there. So, again, that's what's important for a insurance agent to make sure they're asking the question, tell me about the property. Is it already tenant-occupied? Is it ready to be occupied? Is it going to be some just some basic cosmetic work that's going to be done to, to spruce it up between tenants? Um, and it's going to be ready to go in a week or two. Those are the things you need to do. If it's going to be vacant and undergoing some renovations, we might want to do a vacant dwelling policy. That tells the insurance company there's nobody living in there and there's work going on. So if there is a loss, there's not a question of the claim being paid because it's covered under the proper policy. And even there's a lot of the terminology that I know a lot of lifestyle members here is a builder's policy or a builder's risk policy. The true definition of a builder's risk policy is for ground up construction or to the stud, down to the studs rebuilding. That's the true definition. So again, it's asking the question. When come, someone calls me and says, I need a builder's risk policy, okay, tell me about what you're doing. Maybe you don't really need a builder's risk policy. Maybe you just need a vacant dwelling policy that covers the property during the renovation because, of course, nobody's living there. It's going to cover against things like theft, which is the most common cause of loss on properties being renovated. Um, I make sure that it has water damage coverage because you think about a scenario where the workers might go home for the weekend and not going to work Saturday or Sunday, and a pipe breaks over the weekend, and when they come back on Monday, there's water all over the place. Well, again, if the policy doesn't cover that, if it doesn't have that coverage on there, the members' numbers are <laughs> totally ruined at that yeah. point. 
the 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 asset as well as their <laughs> their numbers and and i know we've we've done some pretty massive rehabs of late and i tend to, i tend to throw that term around as well I'll, I'll confess builders risk but um you've helped educate me over the years it's a hard it's a hard habit to break <laughs> so, that's okay and no. so i understand so again that's why it's it's asking the questions and yeah. if you're ever talking to an insurance company and and you call and say i need a I need a quote for this address, and they don't ask any questions about it, you might want to hang up and call somebody else. Yeah, good point. I want to come back to the TDP1 and 3 here in just a moment, probably in the next segment, but I want to ask you the question, thinking about, talking about, well, are you fixing the roof? Are you fixing the plumbing? Um, Do those things, if I'm fixing them, do those drive a better premium when I get out of that vacancy policy and into that longer term uh, TDP one or three, uh, wh- what goes into that premium? What's driving a higher or a lower premium for me, the investor? Sure, and that's a great question. You really, in Texas, the roof age is probably one of the two or three top rating factors. The newer the roof, the lower the cost of the insurance. Uh, just the odds are that that roof that's put on new is going to be more likely to withstand another hailstorm, unless, of course, it's baseball size. But your average, you know, quarter, dime size, nickel size hail, it's going to withstand that. So the insurance company is not going to have to keep buying a new roof, whereas an older roof is going to be a lot more susceptible to not only hail damage, but water getting in, you know, from some hard-driven rainstorms because the shingles have become worn, they might be warped things like that. So that's why an older roof actually gets to be harder to insure. Uh, insurance companies oftentimes will go out and inspect the exterior of a property yeah, that they're I'll, insuring. I'm going to come back they, to that. We're, we're going to head into a break, Lee, so stick around. We're going to talk about some other factors that affect your premium. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. This is Andy Webb, and I'm joined today by Lee Siegel with Integrity Personal Insurance, and we're talking about that insurance policy that you want to have, not just on your personal house. you got to have it if you've got a loan, obviously, but on your rental property as well. Uh, sleep better at night. And in my case, I got, we took a hail damage at the start of the year. Filed the claim. It was approved. No problem. And we'll be getting a new roof here in the near term. And Lee and I, you and I were talking over the break. And because I'm now putting, I'm going from probably a 12 to 15 year old roof to now a new roof, I can expect a premium refund. So, hey, that's great news. Now, if you've got any questions for Lee, call us at 855-497-4335, 855-497-4335. Or Lee, if they've got questions for you about their current policy or whatever questions they may have in mind, how, how do they reach you guys at Integrity? Yeah, my office number is 972-930-7086. Again, it's 972-930-7086. And my direct extension is 1002. All right, very good. And I just got some listener questions in the email. I think we're going to tie these into our discussion we were just having uh, before the last segment ended. We were talking about that premium and what drives that. We talked about the fact that that roof drives that premium, which is why I'll now get a refund, which is great. What else goes into uh, fa- you know, calculating that, that premium that I'm paying annually? Sure, absolutely. Um, the Of course, the value, so what we're insuring it at, what the replacement cost uh, estimate of the property is, uh, the location um, is going to be different in Dallas and Tarrant County versus Collin or Denton County. Uh, Some of the outlying of the Dallas-Fort Worth areas like Grayson, Hunt, Parker, Johnson, those are going to be less expensive. Uh, Insurance in Central Texas, like in Austin and San Antonio, tends to be less expensive. West Texas is very inexpensive. Where it gets expensive, of course, is near to the Gulf, as we talked about earlier. Um, The type of construction. So if a brick veneer property is going to be less expensive to insure than a wood frame property, a older property built in the 60s or 70s or 50s even is going to be more expensive than newer construction. A 
uh, another uh, rating factor is the foundation. Is it slab versus pier and beam? Slab's going to be less expensive than uh, than the pier and beam crawl space uh, construction. So there's a lot of factors that will go into it. And I know you and I have talked a little bit too. Is people don't realize that there is an insurance credit scoring factor. And not to be confused, because all of people say, well, I have great credit. I have an 800 FICO score. That is wonderful. That will help you get better rates for your financing, for purchasing your property. But that really has no effect on your insurance, because insurance can't look at everything that a FICO has. Insurance agents shouldn't be asking for a Social Security number because it's not necessary, but there's enough information to pull based on your name, birthday, and address for an insurance score, and that's going to be based on very, very limited information, similar to when you're ordering utilities um, and they do a soft pull of your score. So someone could have a wonderful uh, FICO score because maybe they're they're looking more at debt to income ratio. So someone that maybe makes a lot of money, but it doesn't matter as much what their debt is in that situation. But with insurance, it's mostly looking at debt. So that's why you really it's really a big factor between people. So what Andy may be paying for insurance could be completely different than what I'm paying for insurance. So, you know, I have people ask me for just a general rate on a property. It's like, well, I need the person that's buying it. I need to know their name, their birth date, and their address because it can differ from up to hundreds of dollars, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars difference for the exact same property based on a person's insurance credit score. Interesting. And that ties very well into the email that just came in in the door here. Uh, He's got a number of questions, but um, sounds like he's down on the coast around Galveston. Um, He asks, among other things, what happens to the premiums when you file a claim? I think that's a pretty common question, isn't it? Yeah, and that's a great question. And again, it depends on the type of claim. Good part is weather-related claims, hailstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, have zero impact on your on your insurance cost. It's an act of God. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, filing multiple insurance claims of the same type, depending upon the insurance carrier, so there's one company that we write a lot of our clients through, or a couple of them, where they don't care about losses at other locations. So obviously a member that has, you know, multiple properties, you know, there's a hailstorm and they've got, you know, four or five insurance claims on from the same storm, that's not going to affect anything. But there are some companies that just do look at a volume of losses. And so, again, the advantage of working with a broker is we're going to find the companies that don't penalize for filing claims, uh, especially weather-related. Now, again, being very transparent, water claims, fire claims, theft claims, those, even though they're not really your fault per se, they still can impact rates. And so I always tell my clients, feel free to use your insurance, but use it judiciously. Use it for more catastrophic losses. Use it for a new roof. You know, if you've got a $800 loss and a $500 deductible, well, don't file that five hundred or don't file that eight hundred dollar claim, you know, because especially if it's like a water loss, a non weather related loss, because your rates are going to be impacted for a much longer period of time for that small amount of money that you're being paid yeah. by the insurance company. How long how long does that claim follow me around? It's rated on for three years, but it stays on the record for five. Okay. Now, kind of an ancillary question. This uh, I don't know. They didn't give me their name, but um, he says or she says, I have 20 properties. How does filing a claim on one property affect the others, or does it? It does not. It does not. Okay. Very interesting. Um, and the last question here, and we'd ha- I'd had this as one of our talking points. We've talked about the, the, the builder's risk versus vacant dwelling. We've talked a little bit. We'll maybe get into this a little bit more in detail. The um, actual cash value versus replacement costs. He asks about his, his properties are in Galveston. He asks about uh, flood insurance. Can you talk a little bit about flood insurance? And what about me? I'm up here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Do I need flood insurance? 
Well, it depends. It depends on – now, you can be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There's some areas over in Irving that are in a flood-prone area. So, actually, everybody is in a flood zone. doesn't matter where you live. You're in a flood zone. But is it a preferred flood zone where the likelihood is very minimal of having a flood, or is it in a standard flood area? So in areas where it's a standard flood zone, most likely your lender is going to require you to have flood insurance. And that can be very expensive depending upon the location um, to determine costs of flood insurance for the standard flood. You need a flood elevation certificate because that's going to measure the distance from the lowest ground floor of of the property to the base floor elevation of the land. So the higher it's elevated, the less costly it is for the flood insurance. So you really need a flood elevation certificate if you're in a standard flood zone to determine that. Standard flood insurance can run into the thousands of dollars. So it's really important to get all those numbers. Now, up here, or even in the Houston area, many of the areas, uh, many of the properties that flooded from Hurricane Harvey were in preferred flood zones, but they still flooded. So anybody in the Houston area, I strongly recommend getting flood insurance because when the, in the uh, preferred flood zones, the rates are set. You know, it's still going to be around five, $600 a year, but trust me, it's worth having. Yeah, do you want to sleep better at night? I can't think of, we don't have any properties up here in Dallas-Fort Worth where we've got a flood uh, policy. We're just, we, we do our due diligence ahead of time. I talk to brokers, insurance agents like yourself to find out, hey, am I going to have to put a policy in place here? Often you can see that if it's a listed property in the MLS, but do your due diligence. That's the key message. Now, when we come back, I want to talk about those two policy types, and let's talk about dogs. One of the things I'd like to get across is that your whole life you wanted to make a change, right? but you've never had the time, this might be it because we have online education that you can get involved in. We're now going to bring the free workshop to the entire country and really the world. Anybody who is interested can participate in that. We're going to live stream that free workshop and have people online with you on the live stream, talking with you, answering questions, interacting. You're really going to get a great feel for the lifestyles community from this. And you can register for that. So if you want to find out about us, this is a great way to take a look at us and what we do. Lifestyles Unlimited has been helping people succeed since 1990. Join us for our free online real estate workshop and learn the seven principles we teach to run our businesses and provide for our families. Register at LifestylesUnlimitedWorkshop.com. That's LifestylesUnlimitedWorkshop.com. Warning, listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show will change your life. We will teach you how to create wealth and passive income so you can be financially free. And now, back to your host. Welcome back to the show. This is Andy Webb, and today I'm joined by Lee Siegel, and we are talking about insurance. We're in our last segment. If you've got a final question for us, it's 855-497-4335, or send me an email to askandy at luinc dot com and we were talking a little bit over the break and and something i want to make sure to hit upon before we get back to the the kind of pre uh planned topics here is is filing a claim lee so i had the the roof damage i think it was in march or april of this year we moved fairly quickly but let's say i know that a hailstorm hit my house in fort worth somewhere how long do i have after that event to file a claim and once i've filed that claim and gotten it approved how long do i have to actually make the repair to get the full uh, financial benefit? Well, it's a, that's a great question, and the answer is, really, it depends. It depends on the insurance company. Each insurance company has slightly different uh, regulations on that. Generally, it's within a year of filing it, but uh, there is one company that um, uh, has a six-month uh, requirement. So, that's where you got to rely on your agent. You know, call your agent. Say, hey, I think we've got some health damage. You know, what 
what's the time frame that I have to file that, and so that we can look at the specific policy uh, requirements uh, by the different insurance companies. Uh, like I said, generally about a year, and then really even once the uh, claim is filed, a lot of times it's within a year as well on that, or even within 18 months from the event to have it completed. So again, check with your agent, make sure you know exactly, because the last thing you want to do is file it too late. And let me ask you kind of a tangent question to that. So this particular house, right, we were coming up, we were a couple weeks out from uh, policy renewal. What happens if I hit that renewal date? Maybe I go with a totally different carrier and decide a couple months later, you know, I do want to file that claim. Who am I filing with? How do, am I, am I, have I, have I missed, the, missed the bus there? Or what, what happens in that case? No, good question. It, everything in Texas is occurrence-based. So whoever was covering that property when that occurrence happened, they're the ones that were responsible for it. So if you had changed insurance companies, the old insurance company was covering it during that April, March or April hailstorm that you talked about, they are the ones that would have to uh, cover the property. Now, that's where it goes back to possibly not wanting to wait too long because if you had changed insurance and then you had another claim, well, now good luck because now you're <laughs> going to have a fight between the two insurance companies that, uh, as far as who's going to take care of it. Got it. Hey, I'll tell you what. I've got a caller here on the line. Let me pick this up. I've got Eric calling in from uh, Grand Prairie just uh, south of the Metroplex here. Eric, are you with us? Yes, I am. How are you doing today? Great, great. How are you doing, Eric? Can, what, what can we help you with? My question was, he mentioned uh, that you should get a premium refund or a reduction in your premium if you have a new roof. And I had one installed two or three summers ago, and I've never seen a premium reduction or a refund. Uh, and that's, that's very common, Eric. Um, it really, you would think, logically, that when the insurance company knows that they've paid for a new roof, that they would change the rates automatically, that doesn't happen. You need to call your agent when you got a new roof put on so that they can take care of getting that premium adjustment for you. Um, whether the insurance company will go back two years or so, I can't speak specifically for it, but many times they might. Um, you can do you can do back dates of changes on things. So keep that in mind. When you do, Andy, when you have that new roof finalized, make sure you call your agent so that they can process that premium change for you. Oh, you know I will. All right, Eric. Yeah, look into that. Um, be proactive, I guess, is the, is the key word here. Um, so, in other words, they don't do it automatically, the, the insurance company, when they know they, they don't tell the agent that. That's no, correct. You, and and logic, logic tells you that they would, but they don't. But but okay. but then Lee, I think about the insurance industry. They're there to make money too. So you know you're going to have to push on them a little bit. So hey, Eric, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah. And and thank you very much for for the call. We've we're, we're halfway through the last segment here, Lee. I want to try to get in two items here. Um, we we hear a lot about actual cash value and replacement cost policies. Uh, what's the big difference between the two? Yeah, and again, you can use your roof as an example. You know, if you had a if you had a actual cash value policy, uh, means depreciated value, uh, payment schedule type thing, and your roof was cost eight thousand dollars on a normal new roof, well, on a depreciated value, if you had actual cash value coverage, you might get a couple thousand dollars. Might get that much, as opposed to if you had replacement costs, you get the full eight thousand. Of course, less your deductible. So it's really important. There's the cost savings of having an actual cash value policy is so minimal compared to the exposure that you face if you do have a loss. So I don't know why anybody would have an actual cash value policy. Like I said, you know, unless you just have so many properties that you're just looking to minimize your cost on your insurance and you realize you can make it up with all your other properties. But for the average investor, make sure you have replacement cost coverage on your insurance. 
Yeah, I agree with you. It's a it's a, a risk mitigation tactic. We have replacement on all of ours, replacement costs. We're talking about single family here, of course. Um, and so I'm coming to the table with my, my deductible, 1500 bucks. I think it is roughly, and getting a new, uh, in this case, it's it's right around $10,000 uh, roof put onto that property and, and getting a refund at that on my, my premium. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to death. Now, let's shift gears. Last question, I think, for this for the day. Uh, let's talk about dogs. Everybody, everybody has a pet, right? It's a huge business out there. I'm moving in a family today. Later today, uh, they're bringing two dogs with them. Can I, you know, what what is my liability here? Can I actually insure against dog bites? Well, and again, you can. It's every insurance company has a list of restricted breeds, and it's generally going to be the quote unquote vicious breeds: your pit bull, Rottweiler, Doberman, German Shepherd, Chow, Akita. You know, some companies will throw in some other animals that you have no idea. So you want to be, as a landlord, you want to know what insurance uh, company restrictions are so that you can tailor your lease agreement to say, yes, you can have a golden retriever or a Labrador retriever or a Yorkie, but you cannot have these breeds of dogs. Because if you do have one of the vicious breeds and it bites somebody and you have, as a landlord, have allowed that tenant to have that, you're on the hook now because your insurance isn't going to pay for that dog bite. Yeah, and that's that's a very valid point, and it's something I hit upon all the time, which is that that pre that screening and that selection criteria. And if if you take a look at mine, it's 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 got a section on there that addresses pets. You know, how many do we allow? What size is? What's the additional non refundable pet fee? What's that monthly rent you're going to pay? And what breeds don't we allow? And the, you, you named quite quite a few that we have. You know, interestingly, just as an aside, I, I remember uh, talking uh, with an agent once. Huskies with one provider are not are, are, are disallowed. Huskies with the other provider are allowed. So you're going to have to know that information if you're like me and you have multiple carriers uh, for your your sundry properties. Know know which one allows or doesn't allow. You know which which breeds. So, uh, but it's it, it comes up all the time. We we love our animals. We love our pets. Um, any other points of interest on, on, on the animal side? What other uh, liabilities should I think of as, a, as, a, as an owner? Yeah, I mean, so, a, again, you want to be a, a smart landlord. You don't want to be a mean landlord. But uh, another big hazard exposure are trampolines. Um, again, it's one of those things that a lot of insurance companies won't cover that. So before you allow your tenants to have trampolines, and some will allow a trampoline if it's got the mesh around it. So, again, make sure you know what type of things your tenants can and can't have that puts you at a risk. Now, swimming pools are generally fine from a there, – there's really no liability uh, – uh, guidelines or restrictions on pools other than like with diving boards some or slides. Some have some restrictions on that. But again, as a landlord, do you want to open yourself up to a potential hazard? Even if it's going to be covered, do you want to have your your tenants have a neighbor come over and get injured? Even if it is a covered loss, well, they're going to go after the tenant's renter's insurance first but more than likely you as the landlord, they're going to come after your liability coverage as well. Yeah, we know the type of society we're in nowadays, so have proper insurance. We're not going to get into these today, but you mentioned renter's insurance. That's a requirement. I can have them have liability. I can't require them to cover their belongings. Uh, umbrella insurance, uh, great topic to ask your agent when you're out and about. Lee, we're running a little short on time, if you would. I, I, first of all, I appreciate you coming on with me. A lot of great information. My pleasure. Tell, tell me again, how do folks get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, office number is 972-930-7086, again, 972-930-7086, and my direct extension is 1002. And I mentioned at the start of the show, I always see you at the the case studies when we're doing those in the office here in town. Obviously, we haven't had those in a while. Now, I did attend on Thursday uh, one of the virtual case studies, and both of the single-family presenters, you know who they named as being part of their team? Lee Siegel. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so good stuff. They were very, very I'm pleased. Doing, I'm, doing, I'm doing the virtual road show, show next Saturday. For next Saturday. 
Awesome. Yeah. Single family road trip. Very good. I will I will get on that. Hey, I thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show with Andy Webb and my guest today, Lee Siegel. And remember, everything we're talking about, it's not the money. It's the lifestyle. You have a good day. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.